very well. Mr. Stevenson, if you wouldn't mind. But perhaps I could just say, Mr. Bucco, it's not unusual for a planning inspector to have letters from MPs, but it is still quite unusual to have one actually turn up to address an inquiry. So I'm very grateful to you for taking the time to do that. Well, thank you very much indeed. Would you like me to set out my own thinking and then respond to the big question? Well, I'd like to say whatever you would like to say to the inquiry, um, and then it's usual at these events to give the appellant's advocate the opportunity to ask any questions he may have on what you've said. Um, in this case, that's Mr. Trinick, you see, who sits to my right, he appears for the appellant, and I may have some questions of my own by way of clarification, but the floor is yours. Madam, thank you very much indeed. Colleagues, I appreciate this opportunity to give evidence, which obviously I do on behalf of my constituents who would be affected if this application were to be approved and construction of the turbines is envisaged by the developer to go ahead. The background to it, as far as I'm concerned, is worthy of recall and quite simply stated. It is, from the vantage point of my long-suffering constituents, a substantial and ongoing saga which began inevitably against their wishes and by definition without consultation with them three years ago if memory serves me correctly to this month in July 2011 Force 9 Energy came forward with the proposed construction at that time it was clear that the developer did not wish to take part in what I will call a public meeting notwithstanding the professed wishes of local residents and my own, rather, and entirely lawfully, though I would argue not very democratically, they proposed instead to advertise their wares, if I can put it in those terms non-pejoratively, by means of a local exhibition. That was done, and inevitably the attempt was made to persuade local residents that this was a desirable development, that it would meet an energy need, and that it would not have a detrimental impact upon the environment, and should therefore be something accepted by Aylesbury Vale District Council and not uncongenial to local residents. I think I can fairly say that local views were and continue to be different. It is perhaps worth recalling that once the application came to be considered by Aylesbury Vale District Council, it was turned down, and it was turned down, of course, on the 20th of March 2013, principally on three grounds. First, that in non-conformity with, or dare I say, violation of the National Planning Policy Framework, the construction of the turbines would interfere with and have a detrimental impact upon intimate rolling landscape. That was, if you like, simply in visual and landscape terms, in terms of responsibility of the custodianship of the local environment, undesirable and a negative. Secondly, it was thought that the size of the turbines and their intended siting in that location would harm residential amenity causing local dwellings to become unattractive dwellings in which to reside. And thirdly, there was an issue, Madame, of local access, or rather perhaps the absence thereof, in that, according to my recollection and understanding, local landowners were distinctly unkeen on the idea development and would be heavily resistant to access if they weren't legally obliged to grant it. It seems to me that those objections that apply then apply now, and in making the judgment that local authority representatives made then, they were reflecting then as now both strong planning concerns and palpably the preponderant opinion of the local community which was in opposition to the application. And that leads me 
madam to the second part of my remarks which is around the subject of local opinion very specifically i think that there should be no room for doubt whatsoever i would like to make the argument in terms that factually brook of no contradiction that the public in my constituency whom it's my duty to represent and with whose views i am concerned are overwhelmingly to a man and a woman against this proposed development i have myself received in excess of a hundred communications from local residents and if memory serves me correctly and i think it does from residents of the constituency i have not received a letter or other communication in support of the proposed development. Neither, madam, and you won't be surprised to hear this, have I received communications from people who are so fired up as to communicate with me, but have sat uncomfortably on the fence. That hasn't happened either. For the avoidance of doubt, the opposition has been implacable and uniform across residents of the Buckingham constituency, hailing principally, as you would expect, from people who live in and around the Stoke Hammond area, but not confined exclusively there too. A hundred or so communications, a petition signed by 2,000 people. Aylesbury Vale District Council, I think, received something of the order of 1,300 written representations on the matter, the overwhelming body of which, in my understanding, were against the application. It was to be expected they would get a lot more letters than I, for the simple reason that they're the planning authority, not I, but those are the numbers. And again, I believe I'm right in saying that all six parish councils that had an interest in, and I think it would be fair to say, locus standi regarding the matter, were against the application. That might, and I leave you, Madam, and others to reflect upon this point if you judge it relevant, explain why Force 9 Energy, which would presumably not otherwise be a shy institution, was reluctant publicly to engage in a debate on the matter. Now, my own feeling was and remains that if people want to construct something new and relatively controversial in an area, even if they are locally based, and most certainly if they are not locally based, they might be thought to have, and I would argue that they do, some sort of moral responsibility actively to debate with local people the merits or otherwise of their proposal. They were not willing then, and as far as I'm aware, they have not been willing since. Now, quite what explains this reticence is, of course, for you to determine, but I am arguing that they knew perfectly well that what they had in mind wasn't popular, wasn't wanted, would be profoundly resisted by local people, and that if they engaged in the public debate, notwithstanding the legendary and unparalleled courtesy of the constituents of Buckingham, they would come away from a public meeting with a very graphically illustrated opposition to what they had in mind. Therefore, as developers on these occasions tend to prefer, they preferred the idea of a low-key exhibition controlled by them in which people can be taken away and aside as sort of atomized individuals and given a gentle talking to and have explained to them the munificent benefits of what the planner for profit intends to achieve. Now, my view, as I say, is that that wasn't very satisfactory. And I'm sorry that the offer of our hospitality on the 16th of September 2011 in Stoke Hammond was rejected. I was there. I, mean, I do have some other commitments, but I felt able to be present to make the argument in support of my constituents. We would have been delighted to welcome a representative of Force Iron Energy and would have treated that person with all due courtesy and been willing to hear him or her, but unfortunately none of them was available. I come to what I regard as quite a central point, Madam, in respect of these proceedings and that is the particular salience of the revised and updated guidance that has come from central government in relation to these matters. Colleagues will doubtless be aware of the announced revised updated guidance on the 29th of July 2013, about which Baroness Hannum, the government's representative in the House of Lords spoke, in which she emphasized 
and I quote, that meeting our energy goals should not be used to justify the wrong development in the wrong location. And that was followed up, as one would hope, by Secretary of State Pickles himself, the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, who in a written ministerial statement, which is a formal document that stands in the parliamentary record on the 10th of October last year, Eric Pickles said that the government's new guidance makes it clear that the need for renewable energy does not automatically override environmental protections and the views of local communities should be listened to. Well, if the views of this local community in my constituency are listened to, those doing the listening will be left with an absolutely unmistakable message that this is a monstrous carbuncle, to coin a phrase, of a proposed development for which people see no need, in which people see real danger, which people locally judge to be profoundly damaging to and unwelcome in this community. And in the very politest terms, we would, I think, be inclined, and I would be inclined on behalf of my constituents to say to Forstein Energy, if you think that there are great benefits in your proposed constructions, you're very welcome to see whether there are takers for them in other communities, but in Buckingham in general and Stoke Hammond, so far as this is concerned in particular, we do not find your arguments attractive. We do not find them any more attractive than the prospect of your hugely tall and unwelcome turbines, not much shorter in height than the London Eye. Grossly visually intrusive with a real threat of substantial and damaging flicker, not in my experience likely to generate a very large quantity of energy in any case, but for all the reasons I've outlined, thoroughly unwelcome. Aside from that, and I just mentioned this lastly, I believe I'm right in saying that there is thought in some quarters to be a hazard to aviation. The site is located in close proximity to what is an area of potential choke in aviation terms. It may well be others would be in a much better position to elaborate on this point. But the key objection here is that the airspace over Dorcas Lane is judged to be a choke point for uncontrolled air traffic. And a choke point for the illumination and edification of those who are not familiar with the concept is, I understand, generally understood to be an area of congestion vertically and horizontally as a result of high use by pilots. It doesn't seem an ideal place in which to have a massive, visually intrusive, very tall and demonstrably unpopular set of turbines. So just to summarise, the matter was considered by ABDC in a democratic fashion some 16 months ago and was rejected on what I understand to be sound and compelling planning grounds. The applicant, perfectly legitimately unwilling to accept the verdict of the democratically elected local authority or the formidable representations of local people, has availed itself of the right to appeal. In so doing, they are making it clear that their view about the energy needs of the area and their own pursuit of commercial advantage are more important than the rank opposition of my constituents. To that view, madam, they are, of course, perfectly entitled, but in my opinion, they suffer from the quite considerable disadvantage of being wrong. And because those arguments against were compelling to ABDC then and remain so now, because there is a prospect of real local environmental damage of an irrevocable character, and because all of the people who pay my salary living in and around Stoke Hammond are against this, I'm against it too, have been for the last three years and will remain so. And although I'm not generally, madam, in the habit of taking part in every planning inquiry or making oral representations in respect of every appeal, because if I were
were to do that, an MP would never do anything else, and one has to be selective about these matters, I do feel a burning sense of irritation and injustice on behalf of my constituents, and notwithstanding the fact that ordinarily I'm in Westminster during the week and do have some significant duties there, both as a local MP and as Speaker, it was going to be very hard to keep me away from this hearing unless I was told, Mr. Burko, you are not entitled to be here and you are not welcome. But on the assumption that I was going to be given the chance, I wanted to take the chance because I feel for my residents. They are damned hard-working people. They are very loyal to their community. They look out for each other. They have worked voluntarily on this matter, pooling their own resources, both in terms of manpower and woman power, and periodically, I suspect, also in terms of meeting necessary costs through voluntary fundraising and the like, with which I have assisted to the best of my limited ability. And I hope the least I could do would be to turn up today and to put it absolutely clearly on the record that I think they're right, and I think that the developer should, if I may politely say so, give up the unequal struggle gracefully accept that their plans are not wanted in our community and go elsewhere. There is no shame in the applicant making a mistake, only in failing to recognise the fact that they have done so. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Trinney to put any questions he may have, Please. but there is one point that I need to clarify. Um, I hear what you say about the number of your constituents who oppose this proposal, and indeed many of them have come along <coughs> to address me themselves directly uh, and made a similar point that a large number of local residents are completely in opposition to this. But it's important, I think, to bear in mind that I can't be swayed in my decision making by the sheer volume of people either for or against a proposal. But what I have to look at is the merits of the proposal. That, that's right, isn't it? I, or, or do you say otherwise, that I ought to take into account <coughs> the numbers, the volume of people that object? You, as the person charged with making the decision, will be much clearer than I on your legal obligations. And it would be presumptuous for me to try to second-guess you on that, and I don't just as I would be surprised if you said, well, Mr. Berger, I think I can read the parliamentary order paper rather better than you can. And I'd probably be slightly taken aback <coughs> by that, unless I discovered you've got some relevant experience. So I'm happy to accept that you have to make the decision on what you judge to be the planning merits. However, I thought that the conclusive point really here was A, the planning arguments against have already been placed on the record by ABDC, and I'm not aware that ABDC has misled itself on any point of planning law. My understanding is that they grounded their opposition to this application in the content of the national planning policy framework. So if somebody wants to show where they were wrong in that regard, so be it, but I don't believe that they were. But secondly, and surely this is rather significant, Madam, the government has taken the particular step in light of previous ambiguity about the relevance of public opinion, of updating the guidance in order to give greater priority to considerations of landscape, heritage, and local community, local environmental considerations, but also to underline that what people think at local level will be regarded as a salient factor. Now, that is what the Secretary of State has effectively said in that written ministerial statement of October last year. And the very clear message that I got from him and from Baroness Hannon and my understanding is the very clear message other parliamentary colleagues got from the updated guidance as, if you like, trailed and advertised by ministers was, don't worry, previously you might have thought local opinion didn't count.
help her much. From now on, because of this more explicit guidance, strengthening the significance of local opinion, it will count for rather more. So is it the only factor what people locally feel? No. But I thought the government was giving a very clear signal that they wanted it to be a somewhat greater factor. Now, if it should be a somewhat greater factor, it seems to be the combination of the previous sound, in planning terms, decision by the Council on the one hand, together with the uniformity of opposition, not even a preponderance, the word I think I used earlier, but the uniformity of opposition, together, cumulatively, if you like, amount to a pretty high bar, even for a well-financed applicant to overcome. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I suppose, really, what, what I was asking is that um, I, I hear what you say about the revised guidance, but I don't find anything in there that tells me to attach specific weight to the numbers of local people who object. It, it says, obviously, that the need for energy shouldn't override their views, but the planning system always has taken account of people's views. Do, do you say there's something in there now which means that the number of people who object is a factor to which I ought to attach additional weight? Well, I suppose planning guidance you know, is periodically issued, and there are new iterations of it, as there are new iterations of other public policy from time to time. I think I would argue that the fact that the government has come forward within the last nine months and made the point that it has made about the views of local communities being listened to is a sufficient hint to an inspector that greater weight should be attached than in the past. Now, Madam, as you will know, I have to be politically celibate in Westminster because I no longer take part in party politics. I resigned my membership of my own party when I became speaker because that is the convention and the expected course of action that the speaker should take. So I'm wary to tread on private grief, but I think it is a known fact that within the coalition government there are some differences of opinion on the subject of wind farms as between the Liberal Democrat part of the coalition and the Conservative part of the coalition. The Liberal Democrat part of the coalition being altogether keener on onshore wind energy and the Conservatives being somewhat less so. In fact, I seem to recall that the difficulties on that matter led to something of a reshuffle of government ministers. But suffice to say that as far as the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government is concerned, he has specifically and recently talked about the views of local communities being listened to. The fact that he has said that presumably is a signal that he thinks that it wasn't sufficiently writ large before, and is worth therefore emphasizing now. And I don't think really I can say much more than that before being in danger of telling you what your job is. And I'm not going to do that, but I do want to say with absolutely unmistakable force that that is my understanding of the significance of what he said. I know Mr. Secretary Pickles well. He is, amongst other things, a bluntly spoken guy. He does not say things by accident. And in any case, this was a written ministerial statement. So what has been said has not been said accidentally or anecdotally or by some sort of happenstance because of a particular conversation in which he became inadvertently embroiled. It was a conscious decision to say those communities' views should be listened to, the implication of which is that previously it wasn't thought very important to do so, and now it is thought important to do so. Thank you. Thank you for being so open with me about it. Um, obviously, I'll, I'll have to go in and think about how much weight I attach to, to hints and written ministerial statements in comparison with actual policy. Um, but I, I won't take that any further. I'm grateful to you. Well, can I just say, I think that, forgive me, I don't okay. to this in any way. I take your point about hints. I mean, I think that one has to read the words. And this is a written ministerial statement. This is a statement of public policy. You know, it is not a, a discussion on the Daily Politics programme or BBC Question Time. This is a government statement on the record in two Houses of Parliament by Joan Hannan, Baroness Hannan in the House of Lords and by the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government.
government uh, in the House of Commons. So you know, it's a bit more than the comments, if I may say so, that you cite, as I understand it, a statement of policy which presumably must have a practical effect. Indeed, I only used the term hint because you yourself had used it, Mr. McCoy. Okay. And of course, a written ministerial statement does, does carry great weight. I'm just not sure that it's quite as much weight as, say, for, the, for example, the National Planning Policy Framework, uh, which is national policy. But of, of which the application was judged to be a violation in the first place. I hear what you say. Mr. Trinnett, do you have any questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Berger. Good afternoon, Mr. Mm. Sam. Um, I just have one point. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you say, which is unsurprising in terms of the role of public opinion in planning. And I've read what Mr. Pickles has said. I'm horribly familiar with it. Um, I, I, forgive me, I didn't hear your last point. Horribly familiar with what he has said. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, but can you see there's a danger in the approach which is being taken here, the concern around and fight those who promulgate the bit? The, what's good for onshore wind is good for any other type of development. And while onshore wind may be the, the best work at the moment, so far as Mr. Pickles is concerned, uh, what is said about public opinion and the role of public opinion, opinion and planning? can apply to those projects which the government actually does support, for which the public object to. I'm thinking about something like HS2. What's good for onshore wind is good for HS2 in those, in those terms also, isn't it? Well, as a matter of fact, it is. <laughs> I'm not sure if you'll forgive me saying so, that that argument helps the applicant very much. So far as HS2 is concerned, again, forgive me saying so or not, as the case may be, but I intend to say it, I happen to think that there are very, very, very powerful arguments against Type 2 which do not hang exclusively on the fact of public opinion in the areas affected. I think there are very strong arguments about cost and about environmental blight and about damage to the local housing market and about the rupture of local transport networks and the dislocation of ordinary travel and convenience of operation for local people, and so on and so forth. You know, give me the time, and one could set out the argument at some length. Is the opposition of people in the areas affected by HS2 of itself a good enough reason to abandon the whole project? No, I can accept that if there were countervailing arguments in support of such a project, then it could be justified to proceed with it anyway. As it happens, I don't think that there are countervailing arguments of any weight at all, and therefore I also think that you've got a very similar situation with HS2 to the situation here. Considerable opinion in the areas affected against, and strong practical arguments against as well. But I won't dance around what I think is your real challenge to me, which is, are you saying, Mr. Burko, that just because public opinion is against something, it shouldn't be allowed to happen? Because, leaving aside the HS2 example, which you'll forgive me saying so, I don't think it's a particularly well-chosen one, because it seems to me to make my case and not the case of anybody else. Is the opposition of local residents of itself good enough, given that there may be all sorts of worthwhile projects that need to be proceeded with and require planning permission. No, opposition of itself of local residents is not conclusive, but if opposition by local residents is combined with strong planning arguments, then I think that that is conclusive. Let me illustrate, if I may, and just to underwrite, if you like, my own bona fides in this matter, there have been occasions in the course of my 17 years representing the constituency when I've got the distinct impression that there's been local opposition to a particular housing development. But my interpretation of what local need is in terms of the supply of housing, including of affordable housing, has been such that I've not been prepared to join a hue and cry against the developer's application. I remember on one occasion when there was an application for quite a substantial quantity of housing in Winslow. And at that time, in light of the circumstances, the level of demand, the need to cater to that demand, the content of the local plan, it seemed to me that even though there were objections from local people, the best thing I could do was politely to make the argument that in planning terms, the objections were not
not compelling. So I don't always go with local opinion, and I don't think local opinion is all that matters. But when there is a happy confluence between local opinion on the one hand and compelling planning objections on the other, dare I say it in this, the closing days of the Wimbledon Championships, I do think, frankly, it is a case of game, set, and match, as far as my constituents are concerned. The best thing Force 9 Energy could do would be to shake hands, having conceded defeat, and to vacate the premises. Well, as you say, and I, I heard what you said, but you've given me some reassurance, and I think they've given the Inspector some reassurance, because it's clear to me that you recognise the danger of planning by plebiscite, and that public opinion must march hand in hand with policy. And to paraphrase, forgive me for being a bit literary here, but Sir Thomas More and Man for All Seasons in the words of Robert Bolt, you, you don't cut down every policy in the kingdom to get after the devil. Because if you do that, you've lost the protection of that policy when you want it. They must march hand in hand. Do we agree with that? I agree for the need for a march hand in hand, that it isn't all one or all the other. I respect very genuinely your literary illusion and ability to call upon it at no notice. I have to admit that my own, Madame, is perhaps less alluring than that which you've just quoted, and certainly less subtle, but I think perhaps more in conformity with the views of my constituents when I say, not quoting from any poet, but from one of our greatest statesmen, Winston Churchill, that my own approach to the pursuit of constituents' interests is analogous to Churchill's approach to university throughout his life. The family motto in his case was KBO, keep buggering on at all times. In other words, it's not good enough just to say it once and hope that people will get the message. It has to be said over and over and over again. At the point at which you have bored your audience and probably yourself with your ceaseless repetition of the arguments, it is just possible that an intelligent-minded audience will have grasped the point and accepted it. And it's on that basis that you know, I have been pursuing this case for the last three years. And I'm sorry, but I regard that as my duty. And I know my profession is held in very low esteem as a whole. But I do do my best to give voice to what I think are legitimate, well-grounded, and passionately put arguments of my constituents. That's the only justification for my continued existence as a member of parliament. And you know, that's why I've I've since abandoned my post in Westminster today and come here because I wanted to demonstrate my solidarity and, if I may say so, to underline that I think they're completely right. Would I have rushed to give evidence if I thought they were on, my constituents were on very rocky ground? No, I think I would have found an excuse in the form of a competing commitment. I think local residents will testify that they would have found it quite difficult to keep me away. And that's because I believe, as I say, that there is this happy marriage of public opinion on the one hand and planning arguments on the other. Now, clearly, people who've got a great commercial interest in developing these monstrous facilities you know, are going to pursue forever and a day the arguments as long as they can, because they've got a commercial interest in doing so. Mm -hmm. I don't bear them any ill will, but their commercial interests are not of the slightest interest to me. The only thing that's of interest to me is the interests of my constituents and the landscape and heritage of my constituency. I have yet to meet a member of Parliament who says he or she represents an unattractive constituency. And I think I have to say without fear of the contradiction that I represent one of the most attractive constituencies in the country. And I don't think I have to apologise for my determination to ensure that it remains so. Thank you, Mr. Booker. It's an interesting exchange. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very polite response. <laughs> I, I have no further questions, Mr. Booker. As you know, it's not actually me who will be making the decision in this case. It's a report that I write, and Mr. Pickles himself gets to determine the appeal. So perhaps there might be something helpful in that about the way he attaches to local views. It might help to clarify things a bit for us all. But thank you very much indeed for coming along today. It's very much appreciated. Can I thank you for the opportunity, for your courtesy, and sir, thank you for your questions. And I, I would, above all, of course, thank everybody who's here. But I'd like to thank my constituents for the efforts they've made, and I hope that they will bear fruit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Stevenson, you have a turn back to follow. <laughs> Well, yes, that's a good